Pornography is virtually mainstream. It's a massive global industry. About 30% of all internet traffic is uh, supposedly porn related. In a 2006 uh, Australian study of 13 to 16 year old school students, 92% of boys and 61% of girls reported having been exposed to pornography online. And these figures are also consistent with, um, with international data. Although you might also note that 2006 is well before um, the widespread use of smartphones and laptop um, programs in schools, which are likely to have increased uh, that, that rate of exposure. Young men are much more likely than their female peers to use porn for sexual excitement and for, for masturbation, to use it alone and in same-sex groups, to view a wider array of images, and to initiate its use rather than to be introduced to it by an intimate partner. Based on the scholarly literature and on what the industry itself says, at the same time that pornography has become more pervasive, more accessible, more mainstream, it's also become harder, rougher, more aggressive, more hardcore, um, and that's, that's directed towards women. This pervasive and often aggressive porn is shaping young people's sexual expectations and practices. Sexual exploration is a normal and healthy part of adolescent development and while it's not new for porn to play a role in young people's sexual exploration, um, porn is no longer just one of many voices in young people's sexual world. Rather, in recent times, pornography has become a central mediator in the ways that young people think about and learn about sexuality. Lots of young people describe some awareness of the sort of artificial nature of pornography that it's constructed. Often their analyses are very superficial. But at the same time, they often describe the ways in which the signature sex acts of contemporary pornography are making their ways into um, their own sexual practices. In the contemporary context, the loudness of the porn voice um, in the shaping of the sexual script is accentuated by the near silence of some other voices. So despite the highly sexualised cultural environment in which young people grow up, often in places like homes and schools, we really struggle to have the conversations with them um, about these issues. Formal sexuality education varies significantly in quantity and quality. That's the case in Australia, and I'm led to believe that that's the case in New Zealand as well. Um, and porn is arguably now our most prominent sex educator. Young people are learning that sexual pleasure is derived from aggressive, penetrative sex. There's a very strong focus on penetrative. And learning uh, sexual positions, practices and techniques from what they see in porn. And porn is shaping the types of sexual practices that young men are initiating with their, with their partners to include things like um, deep, what the industry calls deep throating, so fellatio with the penis in the back of the throat inducing gagging, um, heterosexual anal sex, and ejaculation on faces and bodies. Sometimes the young men that we've interviewed have been genuinely surprised that what they want to mimic from porn is not what their partners wanted to engage in because the women in porn look like they love it. Sometimes young women initiate porn-like sex and um, it's really important to note that, as I mentioned before, people do have different sexual tastes and um, some young women, for example, might really like uh, heterosexual anal sex, but the research indicates that that's not the most common experience by far. Most young women that try it don't like it and don't want to do it again, and yet pornography completely normalises um, heterosexual anal sex. So significantly, porn is normalising sex acts that in the real world many women don't want to engage in. We know from a range of research that young people um, are capable of reading complex verbal and non-verbal cues about consent. But there's a question about how repeated consumption of material that shows sort of perpetual male sexual readiness and female sexual availability might impact on those capacities. Like our sexuality more broadly, consent is also partly socially constructed. What we think is part of the script and what we ought to consent to is shaped by our understanding of, of things beyond our own um, individual drives and tastes. 
the influence of pornography on the contemporary sexual scripts available to young people uh, raise really serious implications for young people's capacity to negotiate free, full and enthusiastic consent. So while it's complex and nuanced, there is reliable evidence that there is a relationship between consumption of pornography and sexual, sexually aggressive attitudes and behaviours towards women. Given the gendered nature both of um, consumption, it's much more likely to be young men that are consuming pornography, and the gendered nature of the material, it's the women that are the targets of the aggression in pornography. Um, it's unsurprising then that the impact of porn's influence is different, is very gendered, it's very different for young men and for young women. For young people who are same-sex attracted, porn can take on another level of significance. Growing up in spaces in which um, same-sex relationships, desire, are often invisible, and sometimes when they're not invisible, they're derided. Uh, young people talk about porn being a space to which they can go and see that um, there are other people also who are attracted to people of the same sex. At the same time, same-sex porn conveys to young people that are same-sex attracted some of the very same messages that straight porn conveys to straight young people. So it has the same sorts of messages about body image, sexual health, sexual availability, pleasure, consent and performance. And interestingly, some people have argued that it also has some, some common portrayals of gender, power and aggression as we see in heterosexual porn. And in doing so, actually reinforces a homophobic discourse. The pornography contributes to the cultural constructions of, of gender and sex that create an environment in which violence against women is tolerated, condoned and perpetuated. Now, research has identified two key underlying determinants of gender-based violence, gender stereotypes and unequal gender relations. Not only does pornography routinely portray both gender stereotypes and unequal gender relations, it eroticizes them, it makes them sexy. And it does so while claiming to be liberating. Pornography contributes to this scaffolding, to use Nicola's term, uh, for men's violence against women. Now, I want to be clear here that we're not suggesting that pornography is the only or even the key cause of uh, male violence against women. Um, nor are we saying that if it weren't for pornography, there'd be no gender-based violence. Gender-based violence is, is a long-standing social problem of pandemic proportions. But the particular policies and cultural norms that legitimise, reinforce and perpetuate its practice vary over time and space. If we want to prevent gender-based violence, then we must challenge these factors wherever they occur. And fundamental to this task is to equip individuals, communities uh, and leaders to have the eyes to see, to, to recognise where harmful constructions of gender and power are, are propagated. So, pornography is no longer uh, a centrefold which young people stumble across here and there. Rather, it's pervasive, easily accessible, and commonly aggressive and degrading to women. And it's not only shaping young people's understandings of what sex is, but also contributing to the cultural understandings of how to be men and to be women, how they should, be, how they should relate, who's in control, who should be treated with dignity and respect, and who shouldn't be. Young people's sexual imaginations and experiences ought not to be confined to the sorts of sexual scripts that pornography promotes.